Hey, good morning. Let's give it a little bit more time for more people to join. Kevin, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, looks like we don't have any anybody joining yet. I don't know. Maybe we can wait another couple of minutes. Yeah, uh, I've got a few minutes, but uh, you know, I, I also dumped a bunch of links into the Slack channel. So if people, yeah. are, I think there's a, there's a bunch of YouTube links in there for some talks they can watch. Yeah, yeah. And maybe, yeah, let's see if somebody else joins. Uh, otherwise, I, I think we could just go by the, by the links on the channel. Because I mean, I, I don't know if it really makes sense to to um, to go over the same material, right? So if nobody's joining. So. Yeah, no worries.
Yeah, maybe maybe we could do a little bit of uh, you know of, of an interactive session i guess and maybe i can just kind of we can just ask questions or, or i can ask questions and you know like um so i'm i'm curious um how how do you get started i mean i mean you you have web assembly and then you have a runtime and you want to be able to run the the bytecode uh, with the runtime, right? And how would you get started with the uh, WSCC? Uh, sure. So uh, there's a couple of tutorials on the wasp.dev website that, that walk you through the process of getting started. But the, the basic idea is that WebAssembly on its own is a pretty basic format. You're, you can only pass and receive numeric arguments and return values. So to do anything more interesting than that, you've got to put a layer on top of the core WebAssembly spec. And uh, for us, that layer is a, um, a WebAssembly RPC standard called WAPC. Uh, I'll put the WAPC link in the, in the Slack channel as well. Uh, and so that basically that one puts a wrapper around basic WebAssembly function calls that let you uh, send and receive um, arbitrary binary payloads. So it doesn't really care what the contents of those uh, those binaries are. So they can mean whatever you want them to mean, as long as the WebAssembly module and the runtime agree on that meaning. And so above the WAPC stuff is where WASC sits. And WASC adds the, the cloud native runtime aspect uh, and the, the actor model aspect to uh, the WebAssembly stuff. And so the tutorial that's out on the website the first thing that it has you do is you can make an actor that uh, responds to HTTP requests uh, with you know the the typical JSON uh, hello world. And what's mm -hmm. unique about WASC in in how that works is unlike uh, the experience of creating a microservice in Go or C sharp or any of the other languages that I might use for for my cloud native type uh, services. In WASC, the, the the creation of an HTTP uh, server endpoint is done by what's called a capability provider. It isn't part of the actor code that you write. Um, all of your business logic is decoupled from all of the things that you would think of as cloud native capabilities. So you don't start your own HTTP endpoints. You don't uh, have to choose a, a library dependency when you want to talk to a database. Uh, you don't have to choose a library dependency when you want to talk to a blob store. All of those are abstractions. And the providers that satisfy those for you are bound uh, at runtime. And so you can choose you, you know, you, you compile your, um, your, your hello world actor to, to return a, a JSON payload, but uh, how it returns that payload is not, is not your concern. So at runtime, you can switch from maybe a lightweight web server when you're in development and testing to uh, a super high uh, throughput uh, multi-threaded uh, beast of a web server in production. It's all up to you, but mm -hmm. our opinion is that you shouldn't have to recompile and redeploy your code in order to scale it. Uh, so, Got it. so there's a, a runtime you can change the components uh, depending on, you know, how you want to run your, whatever you're trying to run, right? Then also you can add on some modules for example, like if you want to connect to a database, right? So that will be an additional module, but that can be added also at runtime. Is that is that accurate? 
Yep. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, yeah. So let me see. I'm trying to. Uh, Do you have a, a higher level overview of um, kind of how this fits in compared to like other kind of normal container runtime? I, I saw it mentioned like container lists because I know there's some, there's like the WASI stuff where you could basically run WASM almost like a normal container, but I was kind of curious. Um, it sounds like this is almost an alternative to that. But I was just curious how the, the flow is, if you have any diagrams or something that kind of um, shows how the request flows are. Yeah, so I've got some diagrams. Uh, there's a couple in, that you can see in the slides and in the videos that are up on that YouTube uh, playlist. Uh, I ha actually had a bunch of slides that I was going to walk through today, uh, but they, uh, they're they actually on my my company machine and I can't seem to find a decent way to get them out from behind that firewall. Um, but a, an overall, where this sits is, you know, we started off uh, with our cloud applications building stuff that runs on, on, you know, on bare metal in data centers. And then we moved from bare metal, metal in data centers to uh, virtual machines. But the virtual machines that we built were still kind of uh, bespoke and customized to a particular application. Uh, I remember uh, some really ugly deployment days when we had uh, individuals or even entire teams in charge of uh, essentially stamping out these virtual machines when we needed to do a deployment. And so that's where how we ended up with containers. And so now we deploy our Docker images to uh, Kubernetes or Nomad or you know any uh, any other uh, container runtime. And then uh, what I think is the next evolution of that is uh, not deploying containers, but deploying WebAssembly modules. And um, with a WebAssembly module, uh, it's smaller, it's faster, it's more secure than regular containers. The only difference is that WebAssembly modules can't do on their own what your software running in a container can do. So uh, how do you give a WebAssembly module the capability to do things in the cloud? And that's where the WASP runtime comes in. It's basically a matchmaker between a WebAssembly module that has a declarative set of uses for capabilities and these capability providers. It uh, binds them at runtime and then allows them to communicate. Uh, and um, so, the one of the design goals behind WASC is that you can run it anywhere. And so I can run the, I can put this runtime on a Raspberry Pi, I can put it uh, in a cloud, I can put it on my laptop, and the WebAssembly modules, which are my actors and my business logic, those don't have to be recompiled uh, at all, because the WebAssembly format is, is portable. Yeah, did, did that answer your did, question, or just did it make? Uh, I th I think for me it, it it's still a little abstract in terms of like how the deployment looks, how the how the kind of request architecture goes through, say in like a Kubernetes environment. Maybe I'm just thinking about it from like too conventional of an approach. Um, yeah, so, but I was comparing yeah. it with WASI because the WASI approach is like using WebAssembly, but it's basically building. You could use it to build containers that are kind of like containers today, it's just WASM, it's just a different architecture. Yeah, so the, the difference between WASC and WASI is uh, with a WASI module, you're basically poking holes in the WebAssembly module uh, through these imports that are satisfied by uh, a runtime that knows about the WASI spec. And so there's a couple of them, WASM time is one, WASM three will do it, uh, WASMer will do it. Um, most of them will uh, allow you to, to choose to expose the, the WASI functions to a module. And what that really does is give it uh, access to the file system and uh, some other uh, basic capabilities. And 
you can you can make that uh, it's still it, it's still a little bit more secure than if you were just running that stuff on a base operating system or in a raw container but uh, the our the opinion at the WASC level is that actors are, uh, in being pure business logic shouldn't have access to the file system they shouldn't have access to an environment they shouldn't have access to anything that they don't have permission to have access to and uh, so we have a uh, security system in place that secures capabilities at a high level so the, the capabilities in WASI are uh, very much at the kernel level can you write to this file descriptor yes or no um, the capabilities at the WASC level are more uh, at the cloud service level so can you communicate with a blob store? Can you communicate with a key value store? Yes or no? And uh, let's see if I can share my screen and show uh, some of that. Um, okay, yeah, that, that, that makes a little more sense. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, um, for, for some reason, uh, my terminal window does not show up as an option for uh, something that I can share in this meeting. Um, not really sure. Are you in a, are you, are you in your Mac or something or? No, I don't, I, I don't own a Mac. Uh, this is uh, Linux. Um, yeah, Linux Zoom might be different, yeah. So. so I can share some code and then maybe that will be, maybe that'll be a little bit less uh, abstract. Um, so is everybody looking at um, a yep, uh, see some Rust code? Uh, and I, okay, so you can see that then. Okay, so what we're looking at is the code for an actor written in Rust, uh, but it's using the WASC uh, runtime. And the the key pieces here is that actors are are reactive. They're very much like, um, think of them like lambdas where uh, they get an event or a message and in response to that, they execute some logic and then they return. What's different about an actor, uh, so this is, this is the list of messages that it handles. In this case, it handles this, something called an ADSB message, uh, which there's a capability provider that I have running on a Raspberry Pi. Um, I can't show it to you because the camera is not mobile, but it's, it's over there ish. Um, uh, the capability that, that I have running on that Pi is uh, re is pulling um, radio signals off of an antenna that uh, contain a list of uh, planes that are flying overhead within about a 100 kilometer radius. And so every time I get one of those messages, that provider uh, decodes it and if I had access to the terminal I could show you what those those raw messages look like uh, it decodes it and then sends it to uh, this actor and so in response this actor uh, loads up the the state of an aircraft uh, applies the new state uh, and then uh, puts it back in the key value store and so if you look at this load state function here this this call right here does a key value get. Now, obviously the, the WebAssembly module itself doesn't have access to a key value store, but it can tell the host, uh, please fulfill this key value get request on my behalf. And then if the actor has the secure privilege uh, to do so, it'll then go and talk to it. And what's, in, what's important about this function call is that it's an abstraction. It's, it's a key value get, but you don't see what you typically would see in a microservice in Go or, or another language, even in Rust, is you would see uh, creating a client connection to uh, Redis and then initializing it with some uh, connection string and some security information, you know, the username and the password and the host none of that is there all you're doing is declaring your intent to fetch a data at a specific key from a key value store and what that allows you to do is <clears throat> first and foremost it allows you to test this thing in isolation 
because you can talk to any key value store, including an in-memory one, without ever recompiling your WebAssembly module. But in, in production, what it allows you to do is things like switch your capability provider from Redis to Cassandra to console or memcached uh, without ever redeploying, even redeploying your, your module. This module can stay running live in production and have its capability provider swapped out without ever even dropping a message. So in this case, it's a runtime that has all the drivers for so that the, satisfy all these interfaces or? Yep. Yeah, capability providers are plugins. So you can write one for anything that is a capability. And in my case, I've, I've got a capability that decodes the uh, ADSB messages that come in off of a specific radio frequency. But, you know, we've got stock uh, capability providers for uh, S3, for uh, graph databases, for, I've got one for a telnet server, there's HTTP server, uh, HTTP client, uh, you know, all of the things that you can think of that your application or your, your business logic might need in the cloud, but you're no longer uh, carrying around all of that boilerplate as baggage on every single thing that you write. Um, the goal is that you get to write this pure intent of this is what I want my logic to do, and you don't care particularly uh, how that logic is fulfilled, but you can uh, control how it gets fulfilled at runtime by uh, how you configure uh, all of the providers. And uh, what's the interface between the business logic here and the, the actual capability implementation? Um, so at a low level, what happens is um, when I call this key value default dot get it sends uh, a binary payload up to the host that contains essentially an RPC invocation. The host figures out what the target of that invocation is. And in my case, it's a, a key value store. The host took care of binding my actor to, uh, in this case, uh, the Redis key value store. And so the host will then forward that payload to the Redis key value store. Uh, capability provider. The provider handles the request, gets the gets the response, and then the host uh, delivers the response back to the WebAssembly module. And that same interaction also works in reverse, where uh, you know I have a, a, net, a message broker provider for NATS, and NATS, uh, and then in that case you can create a subscription or uh, multiple subscriptions, and every time you get that provider gets a NATS message, it can then deliver it to uh, the appropriate actor. And so the, the host runtime is basically a uh, dispatcher between uh, these tiny actor modules, which contain as close to raw business logic uh, as possible, uh, and the capability providers that are satisfying the non-functional requirements. Is this using any like are these functions uh, capabilities exposed as, as functions to to Wasm, or is there any sort of like a remote RPC that happens here? Yeah, so this is essentially remote RPC. Um, it, it, it's our it, the there's a at, at a low level there is a standard called WAPC that allows us to send and receive binary payloads between the WebAssembly module and the host. And then WASC adds meaning to those payloads on top, uh, things like the key value stores and blob stores and all of that. Those are basically just um, a set of data types defined in uh, something that can be serialized in and out of message pack. And uh, so the host is basically just sending these message pack invocation and invocation response payloads around. And um, in the demo that uh, I might be able to show, uh, if I can figure out how to uh, run a terminal session, um, the way the host runtime works is it doesn't care where any of these things are. So I can run an actor uh, on this laptop. 
I can run the capability provider over there ish on my uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, I can run other providers um, in Amazon, other ones in Google, other ones in Azure, and through the message bus that the uh, that this runtime uses, it treats everything like it's a single flat topology. Doesn't matter whether you're scheduling it in Kubernetes or not. Uh, it just treats it like one flat topology. And so these actors can communicate with providers um, without need for service discovery and um, in a location independent manner. This is very interesting. Uh, so uh, thank you for the, all the explanation. So um, I have a question. So how do you handle errors? Like if you, um, uh, one of your actors are not, is not responding or, I mean, you have that message boss, right? But then underneath you need to have networking, right? Between, right? So if you have some yeah. errors, do you, do you have a Error handling. Uh, there's a mm -hmm. there's a number of different levels of error handling. So if you look at uh, this function here, in Rust, there's a result type, uh, and if the result type contains OK and then a payload, we know everything succeeded. If it contains the error enum and then a payload, we know there was an error. And so as part of that protocol between uh, actors and the runtime host, it knows how to uh, store uh, an arbitrary error payload on behalf of the actor. And so if the actor fails at any point in processing, uh, we can uh, set that value uh, in the host. And so the host knows when the actor failed. The reverse is also true. The actor will know when the host fails. So these little question marks uh, here in Rust mean uh, you know, attempt to uh, get the result value of that uh, execution, but if it fails, uh, abort and then return an error in response. Um, and did you did you so, have a retry mechanism too, or, 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 um, or just not, so not there, there yet? There is a retry mechanism, but it won't retry when the errors are explicit. So, if the host calls the WebAssembly module uh, locally and the WebAssembly module uh, returns an error, it will assume that that is a legitimate error and it will pass that error on to the consumer of that. Um, there's a, an automatic health check system in the host runtime uh, that invokes the health function on all of these actors. And if the health function doesn't come back or it returns an error, uh, or it returns explicitly an error that you can provide on your own, then uh, the host runtime will know that your actor is unhealthy. And uh, there's, a, there's a, a, uh, an issue open to finish the implementation of this, but basically what will happen is the host runtime will bounce your actor. It will uh, uh, dispose of it and then reload it. Got it. And that'll happen regardless of whether your host runtime is running uh, in or out of Kubernetes. Uh, Microsoft has a, a project called Crustlet that um, is essentially a, an alternate version of Kubelet that runs on Kubernetes nodes that allows you to deploy WebAssembly modules uh, straight to a node without the use of a container. And you can choose either a WASI uh, module or uh, a WASC uh, actor to deploy straight to that node. Uh, there are other, there's other error checking, like I said before, uh, when you're running this in uh, what we call uh, a lattice, which is just a, a cluster of these host runtimes, when you're running it in a lattice, uh, we will detect things like uh, RPC timeouts and do RPC retries and so on. So if we can't communicate with the other host, uh, then that is treated as a, as a different type of failure than if we did communicate with the host and the host did invoke the WebAssembly call and the host got an explicit error in response. Got it. Did you cover what uh, which protocol is the highest level protocol? Is this gRPC? I'm, I came in a little late. How are you communicating? Um, I'm, 
the highest level of the network? I mean, it's TCP, but what is that? Okay, I'm, I'm barely able to hear you. I think Sorry, the question which was... Sorry, which are you using to... Oh, okay, so the protocol. Um, it is not uh, gRPC or uh, anything else like that. It's um, uh, below WASC is an, an RPC protocol designed specifically for WebAssembly called WAPC. And without getting too far into the weeds, one of the problems that I think exists with some WebAssembly runtimes right now is they're either very, very JavaScript specific, so they assume the existence of a browser as your host, or they assume that there is JavaScript glue code, um, uh, like BindGen or things like Mscripten, uh, earlier things like ASM.js, where, long story short, the host could allocate long-lived pointers uh, into the WebAssembly module or the reverse where the WebAssembly module could tell the host to allocate long lead pointers. And that made RPC style calls between the host and the guest uh, stateful, which meant that if a, if a WebAssembly module died after it allocated but did not free, then you could have memory leaks, you could have inconsistent state and all sorts of uh, terrible problems that we know uh, we don't want to have when building state, stateless services in the cloud, even for things like Lambdas. And so uh, WAPC is specifically designed to not only be allocation agnostic, so it doesn't, it, it doesn't rely on the existence or non-existence of a garbage collector inside the WebAssembly module, but it also doesn't allocate anything. It, it is unaware of how either side of that conversation allocates memory. And so what that means is that between any two function calls, uh, which in the host runtime are uh, managed in a, in, a, in a durable queue. So between any two of those function calls, the WebAssembly module can be destroyed or its memory can be wiped uh, and it will have no impact on either the module or the host. That allows me to take an actor that's running on a host in one node start up a second copy of that actor on another node, continue to distribute function calls between the two, take one down and bring another one up, all without ever having to worry about whether I left some sort of dangling pointer somewhere. So uh, gRPC is uh, an excellent point-to-point -point protocol, but um, in trying to adapt it to stateless distributed uh, load balanced function calls across WebAssembly modules uh, just wasn't quite what we were looking for. Okay, thanks. Yep. I'm going to try one more time and, and see if I can share my uh, my terminal. Uh, let's see if I can. You mentioned some of these other projects which kind of emulate a kubelet for running these. Is there something similar for, for WASC that can act as like a kubelet in the Kubernetes environment? Yes, there's a very specific one called Crustlet and uh, you can find it in, uh, Microsoft has a, uh, an organization called Deus Labs. Uh, you can find that on, on GitHub. I'll, I'll post the link in the Slack channel as well. But that's precisely what that does, is if you run Crustlet instead of Kubelet, you can choose to deploy either uh, WASI modules directly to a Kubernetes node with the Kubernetes deployment manifest, or you can choose to deploy a uh, WASC actor uh, directly to a Kubernetes node. And like I said uh, earlier, the, the way WASC uh, form, uh, self-forms these networking clusters is that some of your hosts could be running on uh, in uh, in Crosslet, and some of them can be running uh, in a virtual machine, and some of them can be running on Raspberry Pis or even smaller uh, constrained devices. And because WASC uses NATs as its message bus, uh, all of those things are able to uh, discover each other as though it was a single flat topology with no need for service discovery. 
And um, one of the things that Nats lets us do is with uh, leaf nodes, we can actually control when the traffic is localized versus when it goes, uh, when it uh, you know leaves a cluster or leaves a Kubernetes uh, cluster or uh, hops across clouds and so on. Uh, let me see if I can find. I am still completely unable to share that terminal, which is. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, can you see the terminal window that I've got? Yep. Yep. Black. Yeah, we see it. We see it. Cursor. Okay. So this is uh, right now. It, it, you should just see an empty prompt, right? Yep. That's what we see. Okay. So I have this uh, demo where um, one of the things I wanted to try and do with WASC is to make it generally uh, much easier and much simpler to build distributed applications, but also to enable a, the possibility of thinking about distributed applications in a new way. So when we build microservices and we deploy them to the cloud, we just sort of assume that we're going to build this walled self-contained structure, whether it's a Kubernetes uh, cluster or not, uh, that houses all of our compute. And that's what we think of as a distributed application. But WASC has a more broad view of what a distributed application is. And so we can run all of these hosts anywhere we want to, and uh, they will stitch themselves together into a larger distributed application. And so this demo called Wasm Air uh, essentially builds a clone of the FlightAware application. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, but uh, yep. Yep. with FlightAware, you can basically buy these little $10 uh, devices, put an antenna on the outside of your house, and you'll pull uh, radio data. And you can see it locally, but it also sends it up to a uh, cloud aggregation service so you can see all of these flights in one uh, aggregate pool. And with this uh, application here, we did the same thing, but it took about four hours rather than you know, however long it would have taken to build the same thing using traditional microservices. Um, so there's a, a couple of components here um, that are Actors. I showed the code for this thing called the ADSB processor. And ADSB is just the acronym for the type of radio signal that we have. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that we've got um, a, a level of security that's embedded inside the WebAssembly modules. So one of the things that has burned me as a, uh, in a role of DevOps in deploying con Docker containers is how to secure the applications that are running in them. Uh, in general, they can do whatever whatever they feel like doing. Uh, and we can apply networking and security policies, but the policies are in uh, environments. They don't follow the Docker image. And so if we make a mistake, forget to redeploy something, forget to resynchronize something, it's super easy to accidentally let one of those Docker images fall through our policy enforcement. Uh, with WASC, these actors have their security credentials uh, directly embedded in the file. So I can take a look at the security information on one of these, uh, on one of these actors and uh, yeah, I have to remember to use my own syntax here. So let me see if I can, there we go. So can you see this pretty well or uh, do I need to zoom in more? It's good. Okay. It's good. So, so what we have embedded directly in this module, which is um, a little over a meg, by the way. So instead of having this Docker image where I have a runtime embedded in it and I have all of my dependencies embedded in it. You know, that, that, um, 
that quote about uh, saying that, you know, you own all of your dependencies is, is quite true because they all end up, even if you're building a static binary, those things still end up in, in your application. WASC actually doesn't have the dependencies in them. So inside this uh, module is a, uh, sci a cryptographically signed JSON web token. And so in that token, I have a uh, globally unique identifier for the module itself. So anywhere this module goes after it's been signed, it will always have this identity. I have the identity of the thing that signed it. So essentially the tokens issuer and I can have a, a chain of issuers as long as I want to have, so I can verify the provenance of this module, but my security system can choose whether or not I trust uh, things that were issued by this account. I have things like expiration date, when the token is valid, but the most important thing here is this list of capabilities. Uh, it, this module is allowed to use a key value store it's allowed to uh, bind to a message broker. It can do uh, standard outlogging, and it has access to a custom capability that is my uh, radio receiver or my my uh, my radio provider. Uh, so that's that module, and I also have I also have a. Uh, restful service. Uh, what they call that thing? And this restful service exposes the aggregate flight data that my actor, my processor actor, has generated by, you know, that that uh, small amount of code. And if I look at this one, the code for this is also. Uh, remarkably small. The only thing that we have here is a declaration that we handle HTTP requests, uh, the mandatory health request. And in response to handling this HTTP request, uh, I can query the list of uh, stations. So that's the list of uh, people that are running uh, capability providers for that are attached to these radio receivers. And then I have the list of this uh, aggregate list of all the aircraft in the system. And again, the, the actor was, is responsible for produ producing that list. So in this case, all I have to do is query the cache. And so this line here gets the list of all aircraft in the system. And this one gets the details for a specific aircraft. And again, there's no code to create a Redis connection, no code to create a Cassandra connection, just a declaration of what I want to do with the abstract capabilities that I'm that my actor is allowed to access. Uh, I'm going to see if I can start some of these other services in another terminal window uh, so that I can run this demo. Hopefully this will all work without uh, a uh, massive explosion. I'm going to start a, a WASC host for the um, the processor, which is the thing that re that uh, talks to or the the provider, um, and that's the thing that reads the radio signals. And then uh, once it's bound to an actor, it'll deliver the converted or decoded radio signal messages. All right, so I have started one of those. Um, just pretend like you can see a bunch of really interesting console output. Um, and then I can start a, the processor in another terminal window. And again, just pretend as though you can see that. Um, All right, that's, that's actually not working. Just give me one second here. Let me see if my radio is actually working. All right, 
So I'm going to start the processor host. Sorry about this. I didn't expect to. My uh, <clears throat> my Raspberry Pi over there went to sleep, and I'm not able to establish a network connection to it. So just bear with me while this. So I still seem to have a networking problem here. Uh, oh, there we go. So I don't know if you can see this, but uh, I've got yep, a couple yep. of fl uh, flights that are not advertising their call signs. So that's probably for the Air Force Base that's near my house. And then this other one here, uh, LXJ381. Uh, that that those these two here look the bottom two look like uh, regular commercial flights. So what's happening here is uh, I have a capability provider running on a device or running with Telnet access to a device that has a radio receiver on it. The provider is decoding the signal. The actor is doing business logic with that with those events, and so it's computing state from this event stream. And the event stream on this one radio is about four or five hundred uh, radio packets uh, per second, and then it's uh, aggregating all of that into this flight state. And uh, now I I, I have a. Uh, just a regular console application that is uh, reading the aggregate state generated by these actors or this one, the, yeah, the two actors and uh, also subscribing to uh, the event stream of events that one of the actors is emitting. And uh, you saw earlier that the, the amount of code to get all this stuff to work uh, was, you know, in measured in the tens of lines of code, but that's not really the most important thing here. The most important thing here is that while this demo currently works on a, uh, uh, an RTL SDR hardware device and the aggregate data is stored in Redis, I could change the hardware device that I'm getting this radio from from uh, the little antenna outside my window to some giant thing uh, mounted in my backyard without having to redeploy my actors. And I could switch it from storing the data in Redis to storing it in Cassandra or any other key value store, again, without redeploying the actors. And these actors are unforgeable, so I can't pretend to uh, these actors can't pretend to have an identity that they weren't given. You can't tamper with them because the the hash of the bytes of the WebAssembly module will will fail that check. And further, since I know 
the identity of the, the entity that signed these modules, I know whether or not I trust them to run in this particular environment. So I could have identities that I trust to sign my production pay workloads uh, and uh, I could not trust the entities that sign my, uh, my dev and QA workloads. Got it. Yeah. So I have a question. So this is one, this is the data that's being displayed by signals that are coming to one Raspberry Pi. Is that right? Yep. Right now. And the idea yeah. is that you have some sort of distributed database that has all these flights in it and you have these stations all over the world. Is that the idea? And they communicate? Is there yep. like a distributed database like DNS or something like similar to what DNS does? Is that the idea or am I getting that wrong? Yeah, so basically what it what it amounts to is, so if you can see on the top here, there's a list of stations. Each one of those stations is some piece of hardware that has a capability provider reading data from it. And so because I'm using NATs to connect, those stations could be anywhere in the world. And one that's currently offline right now, a uh, friend of mine, he has his station set up in, uh, in DC area. Uh, so I can have all of these stations running. The, the host for them does not need to be running in the cloud. It can be running close to the source of data, which is, uh, you know, the edge computing is getting more and more important as the amount of raw data we get from these uh, edge devices like radio receivers uh, becomes, uh, you know, unmanageable. So if I were to send all of these events from all of these different flights all the way up to, to the cloud in order to do pre-processing on them, I would uh, quickly overwhelm my cloud and I'd have to scale it up and, and pay for all of that scale. But if I can do some of that pre-processing on the device, uh, that massively impacts the type of architecture I need to support this. The distributed database can be anything I want it to be. So right now it's Redis, and so as long as the as long as the provider running has a connection to the Redis database, um, it doesn't matter where that Redis database is. So for this demo, it's running on uh, the the tower under my desk, but it could be um, you know it could be um, an, an AnyCast type um, DNS address so that. Uh, it finds the most geographically appropriate node based on the IP address of the source, or it just could be a single address to any of the Cassandra nodes that are in my network. Uh, again, those, what I really want to achieve here is the choice of the distributed database should be an implementation detail. It's just something that I choose when I'm choosing how big I want my deployment to be and how much of it I want there to be. But my business logic, the core brains of what it is I'm doing shouldn't change. The problem is that when we build things like this today, that stuff has to change. If I were to change you know, these services from uh, aggregating over Telnet to aggregating over some other protocol and then storing data from Redis to Cassandra, I have to recompile everything and I probably have to re-engineer half of it. But by doing it this way with this very simple actor model where all of my business logic is in these portable distributed actors that can run anywhere in my mesh, uh, I don't have to recompile or redeploy anything to make scale decisions uh, and and move compute to where it's most appropriate. Okay, but at some high level, you choose at one point in time what that distributed database is going to be. You can swap it out to different things, but for the entire system, it's the same distributed database. Yeah. Okay. So the the core components of the system here are... There's an actor that processes uh, uh, flight tracking events that come in from a, uh, a flight tracking capability provider. And there's an actor that provides a restful service on top of the aggregate data. And 
those two things are really the key components that, that make up this system. There's the UI here, but um, you know that that's just a, a essentially a passive consumer. As long as the the design of my system is to process these radio events and uh, convert them into aggregate state, then I can satisfy those requirements however I want without having to change my actors. More importantly, I can move my capability providers from one host to another, I can move my actors from one host to another, and I can choose where I run my compute based on what my needs are, not based on what technology I chose for my client library at the time that I was developing this stuff. Got it. Is it a good practice to have the capability providers close to the actors or it really depends on, you know, just how your architecture application. So, so that's kind of the, that's the cool part is that it doesn't really matter. Uh, I can have the capability provider in, uh, in process inside the same host as the actor. And in some cases that might make a lot of sense. So if the capability provider is sending tens of thousands of messages per second to an actor for processing, it might make a lot of sense to put the actor and that provider in the same host and then have like the, the post-processing actor be uh, in another host downstream somewhere. Uh, but the beauty of it is that because these things are uh, portable and they'll run wherever I want them to, if one, if while I'm prototyping this out and I'm testing this all at home just to see how, if all of this stuff works together, uh, I can run it all in a single process and verify that everything is the way I want it. And then when I want to scale out to production, I don't have to re-engineer my hello world to production anymore. I can take what was running in my single process and just split all of the constituent parts out and then run them at whatever scale I want. So if I want to run 500 instances of the, the radio processing actor, I can do that. I can uh, spread 500 of those across 500 hosts wherever I want to run those and the capability provider will distribute its messages evenly across all 500 of those actors. And if I want to run five of those capability providers uh, that are attached to five different radios and still have 500 different processing actors, I still have that, uh, that message pattern and I haven't had to re-engineer anything. Got it, makes sense here. So, um, any other questions? Right. I think we're running pretty close to time. Yeah, we've got one minute left. So, any other questions? I think this is uh, great, and thanks for the overview. It's, uh, I think it, it it's very interesting how things are moving forward. I mean, the I, I can see this being used in edge computing a lot, where people want to move to some of those uh, capabilities and maybe have some actors at the edge or somewhere yeah. else. So I think the, the yeah. important takeaway here is that the way people are building stuff right now today is if I want something to run at the edge, I have to choose a very specific set of technologies in order for my compute to run on the edge. And if I want my stuff to run in the cloud, I use a totally different set of technologies to run in the cloud. If I want to have compute running inside a browser, I have another entirely different set of technologies that I now have to, to deal with. And if I want all of those things to talk to each other, I have yet another set of technologies I need to deal with. But if I, if I write all of my stuff as these portable actors in WebAssembly, I can deploy them and run them at the edge. I can run them in the cloud. I can run them on tiny devices and I can run them uh, anywhere I want to. I can even run them in the browser. Uh, and I don't have to re-engineer my, uh, my application to make, to change how, how I split up my compute. And more importantly, I don't have to have five different teams with five different skill sets to manage all of these components. I essentially have uh, one stack of stuff that I need to worry about. Yeah, I, I, 
are there any uh, people using it like in the right now or, or is it just still yeah so you know, or, or trying it out there's a there's a number of people using it uh, IBM's hyperledger is using the underlying RPC mechanism uh, so the WAPC stuff uh, there is a, a company that uh, whose name I'm I'm not allowed to mention, but they uh, they build 5G appliances that uh, allow you to uh, that allow customers to grab to download content as well as reshare their 5G bandwidth with other neighbors that are within a, a certain distance of that appliance, and all of the code running on those appliances is uh, uh, WASC actors uh, running inside WASC hosts. There's a couple other companies as well that are using and exploring it. And uh, Capital One is also, you know, working on uh, finding internal projects to use uh, WASC as a basis for. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, any last questions? No? All right, so yeah. Um, all this meeting is recorded, so if anybody wants to watch it, then they can come back. So, All right. um, well, thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, nice, very yeah. cool. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Bye.